Hi, my name is Ralph Sutter and I'm a 3D modeling and animation instructor at Worcester Polytech. Um, I wanted to make a video that explained how to go about setting up a facial rig for your 3D character um, in 3D Studio Max and uh, how you should go about creating morph targets through the use of ZBrush and how you can have them working through a spline based um, UI. In addition, I'll also be showing you guys how to add a simple bone-based rig to your face for jaw control and ear motion in this case. And um, yeah, hopefully it will demystify a lot of the, um, the ideas that you might have about character uh, facial rigging because it's one of the scarier things that you're confronted with when you first start off, start off working in 3D. And it's one of those things that um, people want to learn, but they're just yeah, there's not a lot of information on the web on how to do it. And there's definitely different ways of approaching it. Um, but this is a fairly easy way to do it. And uh, hopefully it'll uh, bring you guys some, some better animation and you'll find it useful. Uh, I should note that the rigging system that I'm about to show you is based on animation for film and not necessarily for for use in a game engine. Um, also before I actually get started I want to point out that I do sort of expect you to have somewhat of an experience in Max to the point where you at least know what morph targets are and how they work and um, how to navigate in there. Obviously I'm not going to go over all those things in this video so before you go any further um, be advised I might jump over a couple of things because I already expect you to know how to use morph targets. Um, if you do not, I might actually create a basic video for morph targets later on, but I do expect you to use that. Another thing is that um, we're going to be using GoZ to send meshes back and forth from 3D Studio Max to ZBrush. Um, so you should have that installed if you're planning on following along with this video. Um, if you do not have it installed and you're manually going to be sending objects back and forth between ZBrush and 3D Studio Max, I actually recommend you stop doing that because there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. So please make sure that you have GoZ up and running uh, for Max. Alright, so a couple of things before we actually um, delve deeper into the morph target creation process, which will be the first step uh, in this process. The second step will be creating the actual uh, spline menu that will control our morph targets. Um, but the first step is, you know, generating the morph targets that we'll need to, to actually have our face animate. Um, a lot of people experience difficulties with ZBrush generated morph targets because of one um, easily fixable issue and that is pivot points that are off. So this character was originally sent over from ZBrush to Max. It's a gremlin by the way, not done, but you know I wanted to use one of my more, my more recent meshes. But if I click on him, you'll see that his pivot points actually located in the center of the world. Now ZBrush does this by default because game characters all have their pivot points in the center of the world. It's good practice to have whatever it is you're working on um, centered to your world while you're working on it. But you should know that ZBrush does that. So if you send a character over for the very first time from ZBrush to Max, don't mess with the pivot. A lot of people like having their pivot centered to the mesh, um, but by doing that you're going to have morph targets that are based on a mesh which has a pivot point in the center of the world and if you have it centered to the mesh as opposed to the world your morph targets will fly off into outer space it'll still deform correctly but it'll veer off into a direction that you don't want it to and that's actually the most common problem uh, in terms of things going wrong uh, with morph target generation in ZBrush so again once you send your mesh over to max don't mess with the pivot point and don't move it around. If I move my head mesh over and send it to ZBrush using GoZ, 
my pivot point will reset to the center of the world and it will be out of alignment. So don't move your mesh, leave it where it is, and don't mess with the pivot point. All right, so let's take a look at this guy's um, actual topology and geometry that he has going on. So again, this is for movie characters. So I'm in wireframe right now, and you can see that this head actually consists of a, a multitude of different components. So I separated out the upper and lower teeth, the tongue is a separate object, and I've also separated this lower ridge of horns on his lower jaw. Each of his uh, eyelids are separate, well, not each of his eyelids, his left and right eyelids are separate, and his eyeballs are separate as well. The eyeballs are pretty logical because you want to be able to animate them independently and have them look off into separate directions. Um, but why did I do it for the teeth and maybe the horns and in this case the eyelids? Well, um, by default animators and 3D modelers are pretty lazy people and you want to make things as easy on yourself as possible. If I'm going to be rigging this face up later on and I know that certain hard surface parts are not going to be deforming like the teeth and these horns it's easier to just separate them out for the time being. So I don't want to actually touch these because they're not going to be deforming through either morph targets or um, the bone system that I'm going to be putting in here later. They're pretty much going to retain their original shape. The same thing is true for the teeth and the gums and the same thing is true for the eyeballs. The teeth or uh, the tongue and the eyelids this is a different story. The reason I separated out the tongue for this guy is because it would be a huge pain in the ass for me to go inside the mouth and try and move the geometry of the tongue around um, whilst making sure not to actually accidentally move any other parts of the mouth and the lips. So I separated it for that reason. The same thing is true for the eyelids. It's a lot easier to generate morph targets for eyelids if they're a separate mesh altogether. Um, this is not something you want to do for a human character because you want that transition between the eyelid and the eye socket to be nice and natural. But seeing as this is a very wrinkly gremlin, it doesn't matter. It actually is not noticeably different, uh, especially once you apply your diffuse texture. So let's go through the basic morph target generation process. So let's actually create a morph target for this guy in ZBrush. Um, currently he already has a bunch of them loaded in there so I'm just going to get rid of those for a second. And I'm going to show you how to send him over to ZBrush, make a facial expression, send it back, and how to load it into a morpher modifier. So I currently have the main head mesh selected and before I send this over I'm going to right click, clone, and make a copy. Not an instance or a reference because whatever changes I make to those are going to reflect on the original head mesh but I'm going to make it a copy. And I'm also going to name it um, something that you know is in accordance to the facial expression that I'm going to be creating in ZBrush. It's a good idea to name whatever you create appropriately uh, because you know you're gonna get a lot of meshes especially when you work with morph targets so having the right names in there will make your life a lot easier so let's make a smile for this guy I'm gonna hit OK and it made a copy for us so I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that I have smile selected your name should be up here and I'm gonna hit the go Z button and again, because we have GoZ installed, it should simply send our head mesh right over to ZBrush, and it did. So here is our mesh in ZBrush. And let's make a smile for this guy. So I'm not going to go over too much sculpting techniques, actually probably none, um, right now because there's just too little time. I just want to show you how easy it is to actually get these morph targets from ZBrush to Max. Um, but let's switch to the move brush, which I believe I already have selected. I do. 
let's enable symmetry by hitting X and let's give this guy a little bit of a smile. Now it's a lot easier to manipulate this face without the teeth, the tongue, and all those objects that are inside the mouth there, right? Um, if I was using the move brush with those meshes there, I'd have to actually hide them or mask them. Uh, and if I forgot about that, I might have accidentally just moved those around as well, which would make the teeth morph, which is not necessarily something that we would want. Um, okay, so here we have our smile mesh. Let's go Z that back to 3D Studio Max. And it loaded it. There it is. Let's move it to the side. So once your mesh is in Max, it's okay to move it around. Before you send it to ZBrush, again, don't ever move it around and don't ever move the pivot around. But once it's in there, it's okay to move it wherever you want it to be. Um, let's apply a Morpher modifier to the original head. Let's right click, pick from scene, and let's load that smile in there. Now let's see how that actually deforms pretty nicely. And that is really how simple it is to get your morph target from ZBrush to 3D Studio Max. Um, you just have to remember to make a copy of your mesh before you send it over to ZBrush. If you do not do that and simply go Z your original head, make changes and go Z back, it will overwrite the original head that you have in your scene. So let me just paste back my original morpher modifier back onto this head uh, because I already went through and created a whole bunch of morph targets so we could simply go from you know the basic ZBrush morph target generation to um, the morph targets and shapes that you'll need for basic facial animation. Uh, so as you can see I already have quite a few loaded into this list here and let me actually just unhide all of the morph target meshes that I have in my scene. Alright, so here is my morph target layer in Max. Um, quite a few different head shapes, um, but most importantly hopefully you'll notice that they're all asymmetrical. So when you create blend shapes or morph targets for your character's head, you should do it asymmetrically. A lot of people will do the same expression for both anatomical sides and that makes your character's facial animation very rigid. You want to have um, individual control over your character's left side and over your character's respective right side of their faces. Um, in addition, you'll also notice that I did separate morph targets for the eyelids and the tongue because again, they're separate meshes. So all of them are already loaded into each respective mesh um, and they're working. And this is pretty much the stage you'll want to be at before you start thinking about creating your spline-based controllers. So let's take a quick look at what we have here. So I have my upper eyelid down motion. I have my lower eyelid upward motion, I have my upper eyelid up motion, and I have my lower lid downward motion. Same is true for the other side of the eye. Again, keep them separate. You don't necessarily want to have them animating together at all the time. Or all the time, sorry. Same thing is true for the head. Let's take a look at some of the morph targets we have. So I have my upper left lip snarl. Again, upper left, anatomical left. Same thing is true for the opposite side, and so on. Right? Pretty clear and self-explanatory. So how do you avoid having to use these pesky sliders all the time to animate your character's face? And how do you get those fancy morph target menus that you see on high-end meshes for animated films? 
it really is pretty simple. Um, let's start off by making a new layer in the layer manager for our spline controls. So make sure you don't have any object selected, create a new layer, and let's call this spline UI. And let's go over to the create panel, shapes, and let's make a rectangle. Draw it out on the floor here. And let's take a closer look at this guy. So in order for this to work properly, you want to make sure that this initial spline box is centered to the world. So let's right click on the transform value up here. And let's right click on these dials to X out the coordinates so that they're all zero. So this rectangle box is now exactly in the center of the world. In addition, well, let me actually just isolate this. In addition, um, we want to make sure that this box is perfectly square. So in the length value, I'm going to just make it one max unit. And in the width, I'm also going to make it one max unit. So here's our container box. I want to make a little controller button that goes inside this box that essentially lives in there, um, which will drive our morph target animation. And the simplest way to do that is to just hold down shift and scale down so that you have your little button. We'll call it button. Again, make sure it's a copy, not an instance or a reference. And let's give that a different color as well. And hit OK. All right. So we want to make sure that this button moves with our container box. So we're definitely going to link this to the actual container. There we go. So now if I move the container, the button will move with it. But how do we prevent the button from moving outside of the boundaries of that container box? Uh, it's actually a lot more easy than you might think. With the button selected, again, make sure you have wireframe on to make sure that you have the button selected or that button shows up in your name box here. Um, go to the motion panel and open up your assigned controller menu. It should already be open by default. And we're going to give this little button some constraints. So I'm going to go to the motion panel, open up the position drop down menu, and Let's take a look at these axes here. So we have the three axes, right? Y, X, and Z. We know that this box is exactly one max unit wide and one max unit tall. What we're going to do is we're going to add a little float limit controller that will prevent this button from moving more than half a max unit in either direction on the X axis because half one way and half the other way combines to one. And the same thing is true for the Y axis. So we want to set it so that it only moves half a unit in one direction and half a unit in the other direction. In addition, I'm going to add a limit that prevents it from moving on the Z axis at all. So let's select X position here and let's assign a controller. Look for the float limit. Hit OK. And the float limit controller menu will pop open. In this menu is where you're going to be specifying the amount of max units that you want it to be limited on the x-axis. So like I said before, half a unit in one direction and negative half a unit in the other direction. Let's X out of this. Let's see if it... And there you go. On the X axis, it already works perfectly. Let's do the same thing for the Y axis. Assign a controller. Float limit. Hit OK. Same values. 0.5 and negative 0.5. Let's make sure 
that it's working correctly. So as you can see, now our button stays within the container. We didn't assign a Y or Z limit yet, so it'll actually still move up and down. We don't want it to do that. So let's go into Z position and let's add one more float limit. Hit OK. And let's just zero out these values. Now it's not going to move on Z at all. It'll just move on Y and X. Great. All right, so let's add one more component to this little controller, which is text. Just going to add some text here. I guess I remembered my uh, previous rigging session because it still has eyelid right in there. Let's add a name for this controller. So right now I'll just keep it name because I want to reuse this button. I don't want to keep going through this process over and over again. So I'm just going to create one name, generic text button. But you do want to be able to distinguish what the controller is for. So, you know, you do need some form of text below it. Um, let's scale this down a little bit. And there we go. Okay. Let's unhide our head again. Um, by the way, my isolation does not work in Max 2014. It seems to be a bug that some other people are experiencing as well. So uh, I have to use the layer manager every once in a while to hide everything again. So here's our generic uh, controller button. I'm just going to rotate it so that it's actually on the same axis as the head facing forward and I'm going to move it over to the side here. So here is our generic button. Um, once you set it up you can actually scale it however you want. It shouldn't affect how it's working. But again you have to set up your uh, controller parameters beforehand because those are based on actual max units. So there we go. And let's make sure that our name is also linked to that container box. Okay. Um, I'm going to set up just one for now and then I'll show you how um, you can use the same controller in a variation for, for a different kind of setup. But let me just shift drag this over. You can. You can just continue making clones of this without any problems. You just want to make sure you do it before you actually use the Reaction Manager to assign a morph target to this controller. So let's set up our eyebrow morphs with one of these controllers. So I'm just going to change the name to Eyebrows or browse because he doesn't really have eyebrows. So brow control. And uh, let's walk through this. It's really simple. So make sure you have the actual control nub selected. I'm going to go up to animation and I'm going to look for reaction manager. So this menu is where we're going to be assigning different morph targets to this little button over here so that we can use the position um, as a value um, that will drive our actual morph target animation. Also, you want to make sure that whenever you have this nub selected that you're in parent selection mode because this allows you to after moving it, um, center it back to your original parent object or whatever it is you linked it to, which is the container here, um, by right clicking on any of the axes, um, little value boxes located next to them. So let's add the actual um, controller setup for this. 
So let's add a master, click on the button again here, simply choose button, which is its world space position, aka its coordinates, and now you'll notice that the other buttons next to it, slave and add selected, are also enabled. I'm just going to hit slave. So add a slave to this here. With that selected, I'm going to click on the actual head object here. And you may notice that it actually has the modifier or the modified object slot available to us. In that slot, you'll actually see our morph targets. And this is why it's super important to actually name your morph targets uh, accordingly. So it's the brow control button. So I'm going to load in all of my brow morph targets. So again, click on slave. You have to do it one by one. It's the one drawback of this. Modified object, morpher, brow down, add slave, modified object, morpher, left brow up, add slave, morpher, modified object, right brow up, and then lastly, auto-saving, modified object, morpher, center brow up. So all of these morph targets are now loaded into that one button. So this one button will be controlling all these morph targets. You'll also notice that now you have all these different states inside of your reaction manager. I'm actually going to delete all of these because by default it will create them for you, but you don't want that. You want to set them yourself. Okay, so here's where things get a little tricky. So this button, as it is, I want its center position to be sort of the neutral um, brow state. Like I don't want anything to happen when the button is in the center. So I'm going to create a state for its current position. Now you'll see that all of those morph targets show up. So right here, you'll also notice that all of them have a value of zero, which means that essentially when the button is in the center of the boundary box, all of these morph targets are set to 0%. So let's name this neutral. Okay. I'm now simply going to move this box up to the upper left corner and I'm going to hit that same create state button. And it'll actually create a state for when that box is in that position. And I'll call this right brow up. And I'm going to look for my right brow up morph target. And I'm simply going to change the value from 0 to 100. And you'll notice that the morph target updated. So let's move that box again. And you see what's happening? It's now going to move from a neutral in the center of the box to a right up morph target. So let's move it over to the right top corner. Let's create another state. Scroll down. Call that left brow up. Let's look for our left brow up morph target. Set that to 100. And now, if we move from the center to the left upper corner, the left brow will be up. But you'll also notice that as I move from the left upper corner to the right upper corner, it'll actually switch between the left up morph target and the right up morph target. So now I actually want to find the center between these two spots on that brow box. So at the topmost part of the box's axis, I want 
that little button to be in the center. So let's look over here, change it to parent again, so we can see those coordinates. And let's make sure that the x value is 0. So it's perfectly in the center on the x-axis. Let's add another state. And this is going to be center brow up. Because in the middle, on the upper axis, I want the center of the brow to be completely up. So let's find our center brow up morph target. Set that to 100. And let's set my left and my right brow up morph targets to be 0. Let's see what this looks like. So it's looking good, but it's blending a little awkwardly. You see how it seems to go down before it actually goes up in the center? So here's where you're going to have to make some decisions. So maybe the center brow morph target never reaches a full 100%, and maybe these left and right morph targets never go down to 0%. Let's see if we get a better result this way. So right brow is up, center is up, and the left brow is up. That looks better. All right, so let's add our down motion. I'm going to go to the lower left corner of this box here. Add another state. And let's call this right brow down. Look for the right brown down morph target. Set it to 100. Move our box over to the right. Our right. Add another state. Call it left brow down. Come on. There we go. Look for the appropriate morph target. Set it to 100. All right, so now this controller is driving all of the brow animation. It's pretty simple, right? So let's center our little button. That's one setup. I'm going to save this. I'm going to set up one a little bit differently. So let's move this copy out of the way and shift drag it over. Okay. So let's say you don't want a controller where you have four corners but you just have a slider where it literally only goes up and down or horizontally. How would you go about doing that? Well, very simple. Um, let's do one for the eyelids. So let's click here and let's name this one upper left lid. Okay. Make sure the text is centered, looks neater. And I'm just going to go back to the motion control panel here. I'm going to reopen the X, Y, and Z positions. And I'm going to change the way um, this little dial box is limited. So I want it to just go up and down. So that means that I want the X values to be set to zero because I don't want it to actually move side to side. So let's do that and let's see if it's now constrained properly and it is. Good. So now I can actually go and just change the shape of the container box to match the way that it's limited in terms of its overall motion. Okay. And I'll just copy this over for the lower left lid. So I'll call it lower left lid. That way we have two. Okay. And I'm just going to move them 
right below one another, like so. Cool. Alright, so same process, right? I'm going to go to the animation menu. I'm going to look for our reaction manager. And um, I'm going to add a master. Click on the button for the upper left lid button. And I'm going to start adding slaves for it. So upper left lid, I'm going to click on the modified morpher uh, eyeball morph targets. And there's only two of them. So upper closed. And let's add the other one. Modified object morpher upper open. Okay, so let's get rid of these states. Let's X them out. And the same thing is true for the eye um, as it is for the brow. So I want the center of this up and down axis to sort of be my neutral. So let's create a state for its current position. Call it neutral. And let's move it all the way up. Let's create a new state. Call it open. And let's look for my upper lid open morph target. Set it to 100. So now it's open. I'm going to move it down. Create a new target state. Call it closed if it lets me. Closed. And simply set the morph target value for the closed morph target to 100. So now, this one button, let me move the menu to the side, will drive that eyelid's up and down motion. Pretty easy. Let's do the same thing for the lower lid. So add another master. Actually, I might just copy this over for the right eye before I link that up. That way I don't have to recreate that. So add a master, click on it, button 03, add a slave, click on the eye, modified object, morpher, lower closed, add another one, modified object, morpher, lower open, and I'm going to do the opposite for this. That way, when these two boxes are closer to one another, the eyes will actually be closed. So, uh, let me get rid of the states here. Create one for its current position. Name it. Neutral. You do want to name them, because if you ever need to edit them, um, having them named appropriately will make your life a lot easier. Um, let's move it up. Create another state. Call it closed. Set this to 100. Move it down as far as it goes. Create another state. And let's name it open. And let's set our open value to 100. So now this object controls this lid, and this object controls the other one. Much easier to manipulate the animations for this head. Um, I'm going to go through and create more of these controllers to show you how they work. Um, and then once I have more of them set up, I'll come back to you and show you how you can actually combi can combine this um, with a look at constraint to create more realistic eyeball animation. So the next time you'll see this, I should have the majority of facial control set up. Hey guys, so I uh, just finished setting up my spline UI and I wanted to share how I did that. So let's go it, uh, through the whole thing from the bottom to the top. 
So my lower lip I set up um, where the neutral position where no morph targets are applied is in the center top box section um, and the morphs are in all the corners. The tongue's neutral position is in the center of the box and then there's four morph targets an up left or up right, up left, down right, down left and it's blending between all of those. The mouth corners, the center of the vertical bar has no morph targets. Up has a morph target up, down has a morph target down. Same is true for the opposite side. And the upper lip is essentially the opposite of the lower lip where the neutral part is in the center bottom of the box and come on it's auto saving and the morph targets are in the four corners there we go so that's it for the lips um, the nostrils are just sliders where the middle of the bar again is neutral the brow we did in the beginning, so that's nothing major. And so what I did was I actually um, used the states to link a look at constraint to this box over here. So if I move this around, the eyes will follow. And I also have a few morph targets that get activated because of it that mimic sort of um, eye area scrunching. Um, but I promised you I'd show you something cool in terms of eyeball motion. Um, the reason I set up the different way in which the upper and the lower lid get controlled, I don't know if you remember, but the upper lid has to be moved up to open and down to close, and the lower lid's the opposite, where it has to be moved up to close and down to open, is because if I select all of the lid buttons in conjunction with the eye button and I move them all at once I get realistic eyeball motion so if you look at the way your eyes function in real life if you look up your upper lids are actually going to go up and your lower lids are going to come up a little if you look down your upper lids are going to come down and your lower lids are going to go down a little. So you get all that animation for free with this setup. Alright, so that essentially covers spline UI. Um, what I'm going to do now is create a simple bone rig for the rest of the gremlin's head. Um, keep in mind that this UI that I created is, an e is a UI that has to remain static. It's not something that can be linked to the rest of your character's rigs or rig parts for animation. So you can't actually rig it to your character's head bone or node. Oh. Um, if you do that, these are all going to animate by themselves. So this is supposed to remain where it is in terms of 3D world space and um, ideally you would create a camera that is permanently fixed on this UI so you can always switch to it or have two viewports open and animate the character's face while you animate the rest of them in the other viewport. Alright, let's move on to uh, a simple bone rig that can work in conjunction with